Okay. Well, uh, I think we can start while we're waiting for more people to join us. And let's start for the introduction. Can everyone see my screen shared? Yes. Great, thank That's you. Good. Thank you. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Zoe Zhang. Uh, I'm a staff person in research division of California Air Resources Board. Thanks very much for joining us on this research seminar. Today's topic is about uh, compartmentalization in multifamily building and its impact on indoor air quality, energy efficiency, and the GHG reductions. So before we start, uh, I want to touch uh, based on a few housekeeping items. So slides for today and the reports for this research contract has already been posted on our website. So here's the link and I will post it uh, later on our chat so you can have access to the link. And the meeting is being recorded and the video will be posted to the same link above. And for questions, you have two ways to uh, ask question. You can either type your question in the chat or raise your hand and then uh, unmute yourself and ask your question once uh, uh, you are called. And if you have any technical issue during the meeting, you can email my manager, Dr. Patrick Wong at the email address uh, shown on the screen. And before I hand this over to our speaker today, uh, I'm going to do a brief introduction about why uh, CARB funded this research. So we know uh, modern family housing is increasing lately and it accounts for more than uh, half of the new residential housing in California now. And unlike single family uh, homes, multifamily units have many shared walls with neighboring units, which provide airflow connections between units and allow for unwanted transfers of air pollutants, odors, noise, and pests. Therefore, achieving health healthy for IQ air, as well as significant energy saving and the GHG reduction is more challenging in multifamily buildings. Compartmentalization or increasing air tightness between units is a process to improve the ceiling of each multifamily unit from adjacent units, other interior spaces and the exterior such that each unit is effectively its own compartment. It can reduce air transfer between units and thus provide improved indoor air quality, energy savings, and GHG reduction benefits. Therefore, Title 24, 2019, effective uh, on January 1st, 2020, required that all new construction multifamily units either meet the compartmentalization requirement of 03 CFM per square feet or provide balanced ventilation to each dwelling unit. While this requirement is a step, uh, excuse me, would you mind to unmute yourself when you are not talking? Zoe, I Zoe. think you're muted. Sorry, Zoe, I muted everyone, Sorry, including <laughs> including you. I Thank apologize. you. Thank I you, Pat. Yeah. Uh, so while this requirement is a step in the right direction, it falls short of providing what's likely need to ensure good indoor air quality and to adequately promote GHG reduction. Newly constructed multifamily buildings can bypass compartmentalization requirements by installing balanced ventilation systems, which will still allow for leakage between units and infiltration due to wind and stack effects. The value for current compartmentalization requirement was based on estimated air ceiling feasibility instead of evidence for specific indoor air quality improvements. Therefore, this study was necessary to quantify 
how compartmentalization requirements and advantage strategy can affect indoor air pollution con concentration, energy, and GHG emission in multifamily buildings. Such data is important to inform the development of modern building standards in support of meeting California's air quality, energy, and climate goals. So today's speakers are Dr. Mark Madara and Dr. Benny uh, Hobb, I'm sorry, Dr. Deborah Hall Bennett. Dr. Mark Madora is the Associate Director of the Western Cooling Efficiency Center at UC Davis. Dr. Madora was a professor in the departments of civil and environmental engineering and mechanical and aerospace engineering from 2009 to 2019 and served as the director of the Western Cooling Efficiency Center from 2008 to 2019. His research interests include, but not limited, to HVAC equipment efficiency improvements, aerosol particle production analysis and application to ceiling, thermal energy distribution and air leakage, and more. Dr. Bennett is the professor and the division chief in the Department of Public Health Sciences, UC Davis. Dr. Bennett's research focuses on the fate, transport, and exposure of organic compounds and particle matters, particulate matters in the indoor environment, including direct consumer product use within the context of both environmental epidemiology and environmental risk assessment. She utilizes both modeling and measurement techniques, bridging the gap between these two lines of inquiry. She has been a leader in indoor fate and transferred modeling and has also conducted numerous field studies in the indoor environment and environmental exposures. With that, please join me. Welcome Dr. Madora and Dr. Bennett, and you may start the presentation now. You can share your screen. Mark, you are muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Now I will try to share my screen. Um, that's not what's supposed to be on there, but I can fix that quickly. Okay, can everybody see the title slide? Okay, good. All right, well, I guess uh, you heard enough about Debbie and I. Um, I would like to, before we get started, uh, point out that there were some key personnel on this project. Uh, Curtis Harrington, who's a research engineer at the WCEC at UC Davis. Scott Alder was a graduate student at the, uh, at the WCEC, and Marianne Gopes is a scientist or researcher, I'm not sure exactly what her title is, at a company called TRC. And I think there's special thanks to her because I think it was TRC who put the idea for this project into the suggestion box at, uh, TR at, uh, at CARB. And therefore, um, we would like to thank her, otherwise we wouldn't be here having this conversation, and she also helped uh, immensely throughout the project. I can barely hear the speaker. Um, that's a comment. Um, is, that, is that any better? I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. All right. Well, I will keep, I will keep going then. Um, okay. So let's proceed. So as background, um, you've heard a bit of this already uh, from Zoe. Um, the one thing I think I'll be a little bit more specific about is that the 2019 Energy Code, which came into force in 2020, requires one of two ways to meet the code. And one is to use ballast ventilation within, a, within an apartment or to be a compartmentalization requirement. And as she mentioned, uh, that is 
CFM at 50 pascals, and that's per square foot of envelope area, including all walls, um, inside, outside, et cetera. And as she mentioned, compartmentalization is sealing a unit both from the exterior, but also from hallways, adjacent units, et cetera. Um, and the idea is to provide indoor air quality benefits, you know, reduce transfer of pollutants, noise, and odor, and in addition, provide some savings in energy and greenhouse gas emissions. In general, this is not a standard practice, uh, principally due to a lack of data quantifying indoor air quality and greenhouse gas impacts at different levels of compartmentalization. So if you'd like this project, was trying to address some of that issue. Um, here's a, a clever little graphic. I didn't make it, so I can call it clever. Um, showing your standard 50s executive smoking in his apartment. Whoops, that was an accident, sorry. Smoking in his apartment. And when, when you do compartmentalization, the people in this apartment will all be happy because the smoke bounces right off the walls. Obviously, that's not what's happening, right? But the idea is to just illustrate that we're sealing the entire envelope of, of an apartment, all the walls and all penetrations. So the goals of the project were to assess the adequacy and the impacts of current codes relative to both ventilation and air tightness. And a key part was to provide primary field data and modeling analyses on compartmentalization and also on ventilation strategies. So in addition to that, we were supposed to investigate impacts of compartmentalization on pollutant transfer, energy use, and greenhouse gas emissions. A lot of that wound up being, some was done in the field, a lot was done with the modeling. And then also to inform updates to improve uh, Title 24 moving forward. Uh, by the way, if you have questions, um, if you're muted, uh, if you put them in the chat, Debbie will listen. When I'm speaking, Debbie will find them and, and bring them up um, if, if, they're, if they're burning questions. So the project objectives were to measure, one second, the, this is in my way here. Let me move this out of my way. That's much better. Now I can see the top of my screen. Um, was to measure the distribution of total air leakage of apartments in the same building. What we mean by distribution, it means statistical distribution. So in other words, because you say that you've got a code that says we need 0 0.3 CFM 50 per square foot, the question is, well, what is the actual distribution of those leakage values in a building. I mean, every apartment's not going to be exactly the same and, and meet the code exactly the same way. Um, similarly, the idea was to measure distribution of mechanical ventilation flow rates. Same idea. Flow rates are supposed to be the same, but they might not be. So the idea was to measure that. Then the idea is to measure inter-apartment inter pollutant transfer. And to do that in, apartment, in apartments with different levels of air tightness, to measure the overall exchange, air exchange rates in apartments with different levels of air tightness, and then to model the air transfer paths, in other words, where does the air go within a building, energy uses and greenhouse gas emissions for different, different designs, different constructions of the building, uh, ventilation strategies and tightness level. And, predominantly ventilation levels and tightness level, but also we looked at the impacts of, of climate on that. Then finally, to analyze the field test and mod modeling results and determine what, what that means, what's the impact of those, and make any suggestions as to what we might do relative to code based upon that. I think we've done most of this already. Um, as I mentioned, Marion works for TRC, and they were responsible for building recruitment and technical support, particularly on the codes. They're very involved in the codes process. Uh, the WCEC at Davis was involved with a bunch of the modeling, um, field measurements, et cetera. 
um, and the Department of Public Health, which is Debbie and, and, and Rebecca, they were working on both the field procedures and the data analysis related to IAQ. So I decided, I did this as lecturing in, at a university, I decided that I would tell you all the answers right now, just in case you fall asleep or get bored or have to leave or anything. I will give you most of the key project findings right at the beginning, and then I'll spend some time trying to back those up. So in terms of building characterization, this is a big takeaway, which was that the measured leakage levels were approximately 50% lower than code. What I mean by lower is tighter, meaning that the, the buildings actually, whether they were targeting that code requirement of 0 0.3 or whether they weren't, they were all roughly 50% tighter than was required by code. And the big takeaway from that is it suggests that a tighter standard is clearly achievable. Unit leakage and ventilation flow rates actually were fairly consistent. The standard deviation of those leakage levels and ventilation flow rates was like 10 to 15%. In terms of indoor air quality, it's a big takeaway is that compartmentalization to stricter leakage targets results in lower gaseous pollutant transfer, which is not a big surprise, but we were able to confirm that. In addition, what we found is there was no observed particulate transfer between the units being tested. So basically, we were measuring the gaseous transport between units, and I'll explain that later. And we were able to measure gaseous transport between units, but we're not able to find any particulate transfer between units, suggesting that the particulates get scrubbed out in the path between units. We also found that the level of nitrous oxide in units with gas, so with gas stoves was higher than the requirement of NAAQS, National Ambient Air Quality Standard. Maybe that's right. Debbie can correct me if I'm wrong. That's right, because um, we modeled this. They didn't actually have gas stoves, but we modeled as if they were built with gas stoves. So we just wanted to specify this is a modeling. Agreed. I was, I was going to point that out, but thank you for pointing it out for me. Then in terms of energy use and greenhouse gas emissions, the savings associated with going from 0.45, so higher than the, than the how would you say, un, not requirement, but potential requirement in the current code, going to potentially new requirement of half that level, which is what we're finding in the field, was about on the order of 5% savings of both HVAC energy and greenhouse gas. Um, in addition, you could get 5 to 20% energy and greenhouse gas savings by going from balanced to single fan ventilation. So basically where that comes from is by only having one fan instead of two and not using all of the energy required to run two fans. Or if you want to keep two fans, if you add a heat exchanger, you could save 16 to 26%, which is quite a dramatic number. Although it has to be noted that this is not including the extra fan power associated with pressure losses. So the savings will be lower than that. Another interesting takeaway from that part of the study was that the energy result, energy plus results that are used for the baseline building and for all the analyses for code compliance in California had a rather high assumed infiltration rates. And that was one problem. But the other was that the way that it's managed, it doesn't account for any sort of window openings. And the reason that we figured out that that, need, that was a problem is that if you don't deal with that, it simulates San Francisco as a cooling dominated climate, uh, which clearly 
is not the case. And so we had to we had to work on managing the data uh, with respect to that. Uh, and this was the thing I just said that the standard prototype dramatically over overestimates infiltration because we had detailed modeling of infiltration rates and the numbers that were that Energy Plus had to be using were very high. Okay, so now let's switch over to the field testing. So we tested three buildings, uh, all in the Bay Area, uh, one in Oakland, one in El Cerrito, and one in San Jose. Two of them were affordable housing, and one was market rate housing. They were all six story and all had the first floor set aside for parking or perhaps something else we couldn't tell exactly all the time. Um, two of them were site built, sort of more conventional construction. One of them was modular. And two of them were trying to meet air, air tightness targets. One, the California Title 24 value. Another, the lead value. And the third was, that was not part of their design uh, to, to meet a leakage target. Two of them were balanced, one with heat recovery, one without, and the third building was an exhaust uh, ventilated building. So the field testing sort of for leakage, this is sort of a, a quick summary of our field testing. So we went to three buildings, in each of the buildings, we tested 10 to 14 units. Doing a, this is a compartmentalization blower door test where the, the apartment is considered a single zone. You pressurize it, and then you measure how much leakage there is at a given pressure in that unit. We did multi-point tests, and we opened the doors and windows uh, in a surrounding units so as to not influence it that way. Uh, same thing with mechanical ventilation flows. In this case, I guess we had we didn't we must have missed a unit in one building. Um, we used a powered flow capture hood, and what that means is that instead of just putting a hood to measure the flow, the hood is driven by a fan, and the idea is that fan makes sure that you're not providing you're not producing any resistance to flow, and therefore therefore biasing your biasing your measurement. This picture right here kind of shows that. Um, we also measured the air change rate using a carbon dioxide decay. We basically ejected CO2, got it to a high level and watched it decay. And that was done in two to three units per building. And then we did gas and particle matter transfer between units in those same units. And the way this was done is we set up a concentration in a quote source unit and then measured that concentration the concentration of that same pollutant, whether it be particles or CO2 in adjacent units. So here are the results, a little more detail. Uh, this is the overall unit leakage. So in building A, remember this was affordable with a 0.3 target, that's where it landed. B had no tightness target at all, but it was modular construction and unit C, had a tightness target of 0.23, and they clearly beat that. Um, this is the standard deviation I referred to earlier. And just to show it a different way, we also expressed it in air changes at 50 pascals. And those don't exactly scale because the surface to volume ratio is not the same for all units. In terms of interunit leakage, and I think this is a, as an important result, we looked at leakage both to the apartment next door, so this would be horizontal adjacent, and also apartments above and below. So in, a part, in building A, what we found was roughly 12% on average to adjacent apartments and 7% in the vertical dimension. However, in apartment B, which was modular construction, the reason I highlighted this is it's dramatically different than the other two. Apartment C, uh, excuse me, building C had 60% horizontal leakage, A had 12%, the modular construction had less than 1%. But in the modular construction, oh, by the way, the reason this is NA is we actually didn't measure it. Um, 
We were only required to do the work in two buildings. We did some extra work in building C just because we could. Um, and so we didn't have we didn't have all all the data for building C, but it was useful to get a third building and get this result. But what we found is that in the modular system, modular building, the vertical leak was about the same as in the non-modular building, but the horizontal was dramatically different. All right, for ventilation systems, we measured supply and exhaust CFM. And what we have, by the way, in this case, this is a little bit misleading. There was actually no dedicated supply exhaust in building C. That's just the measured flow coming through the PTAC unit. The way it was, the way building C was managed is you had as you can see here, a very large exhaust flow, the apartments ran very much depressurized. And most of that flow, you can see was coming in through the PTAC. But this is not a supply fan, so I just wanna make that clear. Um, couple of other takeaways from this slide are one, that both buildings A and B had about the same supply. Building A, interestingly, was a, supposed to be balanced, and it was supposed to have, well, not supposed to have, it did have energy recovery on the ventilation system. But as you can see, it was not balanced, right? The net flow on average was negative, meaning that you had a depressurization of the units in building A, whereas you didn't have so much of that in building B. And this again is a little misleading, because this is measuring the flow through the PTAC. So the net flow actually was minus 142, right? If you don't include the flow from the PTAC, which is sort of, again, not a supply fan. So this one is running very much depressurized. Okay, so this wound up being more of a challenge than anticipated as the, the, the idea of the project was to go to two apartments in each of two buildings and to modify the leakage using an aerosol-based ceiling technology. Um, we can talk, I can talk about that ad nauseum if anybody likes, but long story short, you pressurize the apartment with a blower door, you then fog the apartment with sealant, and the sealant seals the leaks on the way out of the apartment. The idea was that we were going to go into these buildings and choose leakage targets and use this tool, the ceiling technique, to allow us to reach those leak leakage targets. The problem is that when we went to the buildings, they were already quite tight. So we thought we would see buildings with 0 0.3, 0 0.5, something on that order of magnitude of leakage, and then we would seal it down to two different levels. The problem is when we showed up, the buildings were already less than 0.2. So that kind of limited how much we could seal and it let us sort of less, less wiggle room to choose different levels. So the end of, oh, one second, let me let somebody into the talk. The end result of that is that we did go in and seal them some, but we didn't want to seal them too tight. So we, we cut short the sealing process and then the other complication is there were some additional leaks that were added afterwards. So in the end, the variation in leakage between the leaky apartments and the not leaky apartments were, was not much dynamic range. You don't always get what you want, unfortunately. Okay, so, so Debbie, would you like to do this or would you like me to do it? I'll go ahead and do, I'll go ahead and do this. Um, so, as Mark was saying, we designated a source unit and then receiving units. And as you saw on the first slide or earlier in the presentation, we did this in two or three units in a building. So, um, in building A, we did it in the unsealed unit, the partially sealed unit, and the, the one that we sealed most thoroughly, and then had um, measuring equipment to the right, to the left, and above. Um, in building C, because we didn't do sealing in that building, we picked 
uh, one that just was naturally leakier than the other. And so you can see here that over the course of about an hour, um, looking at the um, left hand graph or left hand axis, you can see the CO2 concentrations. Uh, we got them up to around uh, 3,500, 4,000. And then if you look at the, um, the red and the green and the yellow lines, those are the concentrations of CO2 where you need to read the graph on the left-hand side um, with much lower concentrations. And we did two things. We had the fans on and off in the adjoining unit. So let's look at the figure on the right first. That's where the fans are off in the adjoining unit. So there's really nothing driving a pressure difference. And as you can see, we really ramped up that concentration of CO2 in the uh, source unit, but you see virtually no change. This, what, these ones happen to be the ones to the left and below the unit. The, the CO2 level in the receiving units just doesn't budge. But if we turn on those fans in the receiving units, as shown on the figure on the left, you see that we do see an increase in the CO2 level in the receiving units because there is that pressure different, difference um, driving transfer. Mark, can you go ahead and switch to the next slide? Um, and then this is building C where um, the way these units were, there was one wall that had bathrooms, there was one wall that had living rooms, um, and it, depending on whether you were looking to the left or the right, whether you were crossing over a bathroom wall or a living room wall, we saw differences. Whereas crossing over a living room wall in green, you see the CO2 level not budging. Whereas if you were crossing a, over a bathroom wall, uh, you do see the red line um, increasing. Next slide, please. And so this is the gas transfer rates for fans on and fans off in building A. And um, the source units go from the most sealed to the least, to the sort of natural state. 609 was the natural state, 409 was the most sealed. You can see the pressure difference to the two different um, units with the pressure differences being greater in the table below where the kitchen fans were on because there was something to drive that trash, uh, uh, that pressure difference. And so then, Debbie, Debbie, this is Mark. I think I think it's important to maybe note that when we say exhaust fans on, we mean the exhaust fans on in the adjacent units, but yeah. not in the source unit. Just to be clear. Yeah, the source unit. Yeah, that was no kitchen fan on, and we maxed up like you're cooking the biggest meal ever in the uh, in the receiving units and you've got your kitchen exhaust on on full. Um, and then you have the actual rate of air transfer and then the percent of uh, air coming into that unit from the source unit there in the uh, column indicated with the percentage. So you can see that, you know, it's still even with the kitchen fans on, uh, at most, only 3% of the air coming into the receiving unit was coming from our source unit. Um, next slide, please. Um, here is the same information for building C. Um, here you can see that we selected two units that had um, different leakage levels, not because we sealed them, but we just found the two that had the greatest difference due, on, due to the natural variability in the building. And uh, really virtually no transfer at all. Those are all zeros when the kitchen fans and the receiving units were off. But when we were able to drive a bit of pressure difference um, by turning the receiving unit kitchen fans on, you see you know, uh, a little bit, two, two, one to 2% um, coming in, particularly when you were crossing over, like, like we said earlier, the bathroom walls. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the particles, we were actually fairly concerned. Um, you know, we, were, well, we were 
we thought that we were going to see all kinds of particles transferring and wanted to make sure that we really fully understood those. And so it was uh, part of the things to prepare for that. We did the indoor outdoor ratios so we could understand how much particles would be entering the unit from the outdoors. Um, we used dust track samplers and we did overnight. Um, we had intended to do longer sampling, but really at a construction site, there's just so much going on. There's so little that you can control. Um, the only time the units were really empty was overnight. And so um, we, I'll show those results in a minute. We had um, units measuring concentrations with different levels of sealing, um, particularly for, um, particularly for, um, I'm sorry, I got distracted by the note in the um, in the chat. Um, we're going to talk about the CONTAM modeling later in the presentation. Um, this is just the field portion. Um, anyhow, so we have different levels of ceiling, so we can see if the ceiling uh, changed the indoor-outdoor ratio. And then we did the PM transfer experiment uh, simultaneously with the CO2 transfer experiment, and we couldn't. We had to generate PM that wasn't sticky in any way that wasn't going to stick to anything and smell like wouldn't really let us cook inside the units. So we actually used cat litter, um, the old fashioned clay kind, where if you just move it from one bowl to another, you can maintain a fairly high and steady concentration. And, um, you know, we had PM1, 2.5 and 10. We had fairly good mix across the different PM size fractions. We're going to focus on the PM2 results, but all the results were the same in the other size fractions as well. Um, and like I just said, in discussing the CO2 measurements, we did it with the, the purposely sealed levels and the natural ones um, in building C. Next slide, please. Mark, yes, okay. So let's start with our indoor-outdoor ratio. So this is just an example of what our data looked like um, in building A on one of our overnight concentrations. And why I show it is just because you just see that that clear differentiation um, where this is one where we had the, the fan on in one of the units, that uh, red line, it really just dropped it down to nothing where it was running its eight track system and so filtering the air. Um, and then you can see the partially sealed unit that didn't have any sort of um, HVAC on in yellow and it it was clearly lower than the uh, unsealed units. We could only ever have one or two sealed units at a time because we, we only had one partially and one fully sealed unit, but we could put monitors in the unsealed unit and, and just the consistency in the indoor outdoor ratio between those two unsealed units was amazing. I'm um, looking at the figure, the table on the right, um, you can see that in building A, we did things. Um, we actually collected data for five nights, but to the nights, the outdoor concentration was so low, we, it, it didn't, it, we got, it was not useful data. So we go three nights here. You do see, interestingly, night to night variation on the indoor outdoor ratio, but you see very, con very consistent results between unsealed units. You see the turning the HVAC fan on just brought things down to practically nothing. And then the partial seal and the sealed units showing the lower um, lower levels than the unsealed units. In um, building C, you see that the indoor outdoor ratios are actually much higher. That's because the um, there was a P, uh, an exhaust system with a P tap trap, basically kind of letting air in. So that was not an ideal design. So you really let a lot more PM in on the nighttime periods in building C than you did in building A. Next slide, please. Um, I had one clarification before we move on. Mm -hmm. well, and the one that says, and for building A, unsealed fan on, I want to be clear that the fan we're talking about there is not the kitchen exhaust fan, but is the HVAC fan, correct, Debbie? Yes, yes, that's what I was saying, was going through the filter and just really, the HVAC filter and really removing those particles. Which is interesting, because that's a, quite a dramatic reduction. Associate. That's great. With that. We forced the fan on to, to go all night, so <laughs> uh, which you probably wouldn't actually do. The fan would actually probably just be on when you were heating or cooling. So that's a little extreme. Um, you know, most people aren't going to run their fans full time. Next slide, please. 
And then this is the PM transfer. Again, the, the source unit, you need to read the units on the right-hand side for the PM um, 2.5 concentrations. We got them quite high indeed. And then the left-hand side um, has the adjacent units. The, you know, the, the measurement equipment was very sensitive. So if we needed to go into the unit at all beforehand, like to turn the fan on or something like that, we really stirred up just walking in um, quite a bit of PM. So you can see, for example, that's why the yellow line is, is dropping is because we had gone in there. So, and you see those little blips right before, um, right before the, um, the source started. That's where we went. I think, we, I don't know why we were in the one for long, but we obviously had to do something. Those little blips were just us walking in to turn on the fan. So we tried to, you know, leave them set in the condition we we needed the night before and come in. So we didn't even have to go in them with our equipment monitoring. So we tried to do that because it was so sensitive to what was going on. Um, but you can see, really, the PM in, while while we were doing things really didn't um, didn't do much um, at all there. Um, we also had the outdoor levels measured. So you can see the outdoor does sometimes have uh, some movement going on. And that made, for example, in building C, the results slightly uh, more difficult to interpret on that particular one because you had that significant increase in the outdoor concentration. And then that's kind of what was influencing the concentrations um, increasing there. It, it was just Primarily, it was just due to the outdoor um, air coming in. Um, so that is all on the PM transfer. So I'll turn it back over to Mark to go over modeling. Oh, our key indoor air quality results. I forgot about this slide. Um, so no measurable PM 2.5 transfer between units, um, even when we, uh, do you just want to put all the bullets up, Mark? Um, even when we depressurized with the kitchen units and less than 3% of the air coming into the apartment um, when depressurized with the kitchen exhaust fan for the gas phases. The uh, PTAC unit did result in much higher indoor-outdoor ratios on the overnight PM 2.5. Um, and we really did see that impact on the indoor-outdoor ratios with the compartmentalization in building A. Um, so that was great. And then, uh, like we were pointing out before, a big impact of running the H fan, fan continuously overnight. And now I think I'll turn it back over to Mark to go over the CONTAM modeling. Okay, how to get myself unmuted. Um, uh, maybe I'll even let you see what I look like. All right. So, um, as you can see, I like animation and, and Debbie doesn't. Um, so, in terms of overview, what we did is we did the case prototype building uh, modeled in Energy Plus. And then we modeled the airflow through that same building using Contam. And we used Contam. Most of the work, let's be blunt, was in content, right? We didn't muck with Energy Plus very much at all. We just used it to get a, quote, reasonable baseline energy consumption. Then what we did is we took the content calculated outdoor airflow rates and used them to modify the Energy Plus results to analyze the marginal energy implications of leakage and ventilation options in Excel. So we essentially, took away the infiltration out of Excel, I mean, out of, out of the Energy Plus results in Excel and put in using the modeled indoor conditions and outdoor conditions, the outdoor air flow rates from content in order to do the energy modeling. In terms of input data, uh, the leakage distribution, and what I mean by that is the airflow paths were based upon mostly our field testing results, but we also did look through the literature to see what other people had found 
Um, one of the things we didn't measure is the hallway leakage. So we measured the leakage adjacent, total, adjacent up, adjacent sideways, and total, but we didn't measure the difference between leakage to the hallway and to the house, and let's use other, other people's data to do that. Uh, the mechanical ventilation flow rates were based upon field testing, but also made sure that those were reasonable. The kitchen, ex so what we did is we did a sort of a random kitchen exhaust fan use in the building for the content simulations. So rather than saying everybody turns on their kitchen exhaust at the same time in every apartment, we had a random distribution. And the reason for that is because if you make everybody turn all at the same time, well, guess what? The pressure doesn't change between, you know, will change the same in all units or roughly. So what we did is we had a random schedule based upon, I forgot exactly where uh, Debbie and Scott came up with, with that, that distribution. Yeah, we just, we had um, some, from another paper, kind of the average time people spent cooking their meal and that's how we got how long the, the fans were on a distribution for that. And then we just decided that people had dinner between certain hours. I think we had two hour windows for dinner, two hour windows for lunch and two hour windows for breakfast. We couldn't find, we kind of made that. When people ate, we made that up. Yes, we were in charge. You know, nobody, nobody could complain. There, there was no uh, human uh, subject study done in the model. Um, so same thing here. Uh, so Debbie, do you want to say anything about that? The, the, we just the, want to note again that we that you know the units we tested had electric stoves, but we we wanted to get a variety of different sort of scenarios of how and when gases were emitted. So nitrogen dioxide, you know, should there be a building where there are gas stoves? That's something that's intermittent, um, but that gets used in pretty much every unit every day. Um, formaldehyde would be outgassing from building. A, uh, materials so that's something that would be a steady source over time and cigarette smoke would be something that would occur in some units and not others and so we thought and it was intermittent and so we thought that those were three interesting um scenarios and also the gas stove cooking we felt was a relevant one even though it wasn't used in these apartments because that is definitely an area of concern and all the rates were taken from uh the literature to get the distributions. And then we and I sort of said this already. Um, all the parameters were assumed to follow distributions based upon either what we found in the field or on, on results from other studies. Um, I think it's worth noting particle generation and transfer were not simulated. And the reason we didn't do that is because we didn't have any measured results. So like we could just pick a number, right? And stick in a particle transfer number. But we, we did we didn't do that because we didn't we didn't see any, nothing was noticeable during the field testing. So in terms of what configurations we modeled, we modeled three different leakage levels, basically what we found in the field, the current code requirement, and 50% more than current code requirement, because we had assumed that buildings wouldn't all be meeting that code because they're not required to. Uh, for ventilation, we looked at both exhaust, supply, and balanced, and we did them all at the minimum code flow rates. We did four California climate zones. The variability in leakage, we used 0% mostly. Um, the result, what we found, we, we in Sacramento, climate zone 12, we did put in 10% variation, but it didn't, it didn't exactly change the answers very much. So almost all of our results are based upon not including variations in leakage between units. Um, same thing for ventilation rates. Uh, the total permutations were 22. And then what did we produce? We got airflow rates, both the overall air exchange rate for every unit, the actual fresh air ventilation rate, and that's the mechanical supply air plus the outdoor air 
plus corridor air. And that, that's how we defined it. We calculated the sources of airflow, percent coming from mechanical supply, coming from outdoors, come from the corridor, and coming from neighbors. And then we also looked at the distribution of airflows by apartment type. Um, as you might, manage, might imagine, a corner unit is not the same as an interior unit, and in that an interior unit has very little surface area to outdoors, whereas the corner units have much more. We then looked at distributions based upon whether an apartment was at the bottom of the building, in the middle of the building, or the top floor, essentially looking at stack effect. And then in terms of pollutant concentrations, we got an average concentration in each apartment of the three criteria pollutants in our case. We got a maximum hourly concentration in each apartment. We got the pollutant transfer between apartments and a distribution based upon kitchen exhaust fan operation. So for people who do and do not use their kitchen range hoods. And finally, there was another distribution based upon smoking behavior. So we looked at if you're a smoker, what's it look like? If you're a non-smoker living next to a smoker, or if you're a non-smoker not living next to a smoker. So essentially looking at sort of three cases of, of exposure to smoke. And finally, we used NO2 from cooking as a proxy gas. And I believe what we did is we wrote it up sort of concentrations of a fish smell is the way, the way it's written up in the, uh, in the final report. So in terms of the, I would say the headline of this, of this whole project, like what's the impact of compartment, compartmentalization, we looked at the average air change rate, how much it changed when you move from 0.15 to 0.3, and how much it changed moving from 0.15 to 0.45. And basically, you have a 5 to 15% increase in air change rate if you go from what we found in these buildings to uh, the current code, and a 15 to 30% increase where if you went to what we thought would be a typical non-code, a building that complies without using tightness to meet code. Uh, there's a question in the chat, Debbie. Yes, um, I'm working on that. Okay. So one other thing in addition to these average values is the standard deviation and air change rate increased at higher leakage levels, which is another way of saying the variability in the ventilation seen by any given apartment is higher when you have more leakage in the building. And this larger variability is clearly not desirable for IAQ or energy use, right? You would like everybody to be getting sort of the same performance out of their building, either for energy or for IAQ, not depending on which apartment you have to you happen to have bought or, or rented. So fresh outdoor air ventilation increased only slightly with leakage, right? This is the how many CFM per, per square foot you got of fresh air at different leakage levels. So it went from 0.52 to 0.6 when you went from 0.15 to 0.45 for the leakage. Not surprisingly, corner units are overventilated, sucking in extra air that they shared, sucking in extra outdoor air, which in turn they wound up sharing with interior units. This is not a big surprise as the surface area of the corner units to outside is much larger. Uh, blah, 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 I already said that. The other thing we found was that energy benefits at tighter leakage levels were reasonably dependent upon climate. Okay, Debbie, this is you. I'm going to put them all up since you like it that way. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> um, 
Yes, so when we considered the concentration in your own apartment, if you were cooking, um, we saw that with a gas stove, you know, there isn't an indoor NO2 concentration, although I noticed that Jeff Williams is leading a, a discussion on development of one in a couple of weeks. So I'll give a plug for Jeff's uh, upcoming event. Um, we found that the units did exceed the outdoor uh, NAC standard, one hour standard for NO2 of 100 um, ppb. And we did um, just your standard uh, based on the California risk level for formaldehyde, we saw that um, uh, we did, you know, the units were generally over that level, which is what we expect because you see that in other studies. And then uh, finally for the benzene was our model gluten, as, it, as was said for the cigarette smoke. And so we didn't really, you know, if you were smoking in your own unit, we didn't focus on that. We focused on what was happening at the transfers and with the leakier units. Um, if you live next to a smoker and, and assume the smoking rates that um, we, we did, um, you would get just a hair over that one times one time 10 to the minus six, six cancer risk level in the leaker unit. So that's kind of a summary of what we saw in the content modeling results. And we'll show the graphs of those in a minute. Mark, you need to unmute. Got it. Um, okay. So do you want to do these? Do you want me to do these, Debbie? I think you should do the leakage, air leakage, and I'll do the pollutant leakage. Okay. So we already sort of gave you the, the value before, um, the, the average values of what happened to air exchange rate and what happened to fresh air rate, I, I showed you the numbers, but this is showing you the distributions. And one of the things to point out here in these, in these plots is you can see that as you go to higher leakage, the variation becomes much larger than at lower leakage. That's what I mentioned earlier, and this shows it numerically with, with the whisker plot. Uh, I said all those things already. Okay, now what this is, and this is a little bit, our nomenclature is not great. One sec, let me click the. So the last line at the bottom, C is a corner unit and C prime is a middle unit, right? That wasn't necessarily the best choice um, of of nomenclature. But what we have here is we have the fraction of outdoor air at different tightness levels. Um, so, and then C is the corner unit and C prime is the middle unit. So what you see here at the tightest level, this is the fraction of air that's outdoor. And if you look at the middle units, you can see that in the corner units, almost all their air is coming from outdoor. Um, on the other hand, for the middle units, only 30% of the air entering that apartment is coming from outdoors. And what, what you also notice here is that the variation in the fraction of outdoor air changes dramatically as you go to leakier buildings. So for, so the mean value for the corner units, you can see is going down, but the variation is going up much more. And particularly for the middle units, right? The variations here, what you see is for a middle unit, the, vari the variation in the fraction of outdoor air, when you get to the leakier building, can go from almost 0% outdoor air up to 60%. So this is a much larger variation associated with um, being in a middle unit. So how much air, how much outdoor air you get if you're in a leaky building is essentially all over the map. Um, same kind of thing 
for neighbors there. So as you go from a, for the, so these are the, the dark ones are the corner units and the hashed ones are the uh, middle units. In both cases, the fraction of air you get from your neighbors goes up as you would expect. And the variation and how much you get from your neighbors is larger actually in this case for the corner units. You can see this is the variation for a tight building. This is the range for a leaky building. Um, the variations for the middle units, again, it shows the same trend, but the variation did not change quite as much, the, the standard deviation around the mean value. Okay, uh, Debbie, you're up. I am up. Okay, so we thought the most important thing for the intermittent uh, source, which was the NO2, was to look at the hourly concentrations. And so we have the outdoor one hour standard in a red line going across on the left hand side. So this is in your own unit. And here we have three leakage values. So in the blue, you have the um, tightest units in the orange, you have the middle, and in the green, you have the, the, uh, the leakiest. And you can see here what's really driving the difference is whether or not you turned your fan on. So those buildings where you've turned the fan on, you have a nice low NO2 value at the maximum, and, um, and you should be in fairly decent shape. So it really takes home that point, turn the fan on when you're cooking. And you can see that if you don't have the fan on, uh, you have higher concentrations and they exceed the uh, outdoor standard. And as you can see, there is a slight, you see a slight difference um, in the concentrations as the building gets leakier, but it's not uh, so exaggerated. We'll see bigger effects um, later on um, for things that last longer. And then on the right hand side, you look at the maximum transfer from the other units. So if you are not a cooker or if it's a building that you know you have the option of an NO2 or an electric stove, something like that, um, what would you get? And you see here that now the, the solid lines are slightly taller than the checkered lines because if you are a fan user, you're going to be drawing more in from your neighbor when they're cooking, if your cooking time overlaps with theirs. But what you see more dramatically is that the leakier build, the building is, the more transfer you're getting from the neighbor. But in all cases, you're really just, you know, compared to the, the 100 PPB one hour standard, this is the maximum you're ever getting and it's primarily under 10 ppb. So not too much of a concern in terms of how much is being transferred on the NO2. Next slide, please. Oh, but you know what? I'm going to stop here to talk about the uh, fish smell because uh, we were, we, 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 we got, there's no health harm from a fish smell, but we were just thinking from a marketing perspective, if you were building the unit. So we were able to find, um, the smelly compound in the fish, and if you cooked the fish to a dark, um, a dark level, uh, how much was uh, you know, was there right over the stove, and then how much could the nose detect? And we did estimate that with the leaky one, you could probably um, detect uh, a little bit of fish smell. We set the capture efficiency to 50% and left that as a, a fixed value. So we did not vary the capture efficiency of it. But what really was the big difference is some people had it on, or, um, had it on and some had it off. And so were the fans exhausted to the outside? Um, that was basically what we were assuming is that you it was going to the outside that you were capturing and removing 50% of it. So next slide, please. Um, this is our formaldehyde. We actually used um, values from a more recent study for the sources that were measured that were on buildings built with greener materials because that kind of maximized the difference um, between the units. We wanted more variability. 
Um, here you can see it doesn't really matter if you turn your fan on for an hour a day while you're cooking on your overall 24 hour average formaldehyde concentration. But here you can um, really see that the leakier the unit, the lower the typical level um, of the formaldehyde in your unit. But in all cases, it's greater than um, the one in even the one in 100,000 cancer potency level by the state. But I mean, this is sort of what we expect because whenever you, they're consistent with levels measured in, um, in field studies. Um, because formaldehyde is just always going, that's why we didn't see anything with the fans. And because everybody has formaldehyde, you know, not a huge difference by the leakage because it, you know, you're getting your own plus the neighbors and so forth. Next slide, please. Okay, so the benzene, um, you really can't see what's going on at all in the non-smoking units over there on the left, but you see that if you um, do smoke in your apartment, you get a nice high level of benzene, and you do see that the leakier the buildings are, the lower the concentrations are in your own unit. What's much more interesting from a benzene is we, uh, we took the, changed the y-axis to sort of remove the smoker, component. And now these are all non-smoking units. And now we're looking at whether or not you live next to a smoker or not. And so you can see that now as you um, make the building leakier, going from blue to yellow to red, you have a greater concentration of benzene coming from your apartment. So this is undesirable. This is that sort of classic multi-transfer gluten problem that you worry about. And so you do see, yeah, if it's, it's leakier, you're going to be getting the benzene coming from your neighbor. And you can see a portion of your, um, of your distribution of exposure is above the one in a million cancer potency level. And this is kind of averaged over the day. The, the smoker smoked several, several rounds of cigarettes during the day. And then you're just over that line a little bit on the second leaky level, leakage level. Um, but at the tightest level, you really do protect the neighbors from their smoking, uh, your non-smoking neighbors from your smoking neighbors. I think there might be a couple bullets. Um, and I think I've said all that. So I think now I turn it back over to Mark. Well, actually, staying on this slide for just a second. I think it's worth noting that, that we're looking at the cancer risk here, mm -hmm. but it's also worth noting the uh, the smell. I think this is probably a good, I don't know if the smell from smoking comes from gases or comes from particulates. If it comes from particulates, we show the particulates get scrubbed out. If the smell comes from gases, then this says that the leakier the building, the more you're gonna smell smoking in other units. Okay, so in this case, we're looking at the impacts of ventilation system. One second here. So we've got the exhaust only buildings, we've got supply buildings, and we've got balance buildings. And what, what you see is you see the airflow and you see the in air changes per hour, and then flow. And the reason that they're different is because air changes per hour depends upon the volume of your space, whereas the flow um, is, it, it normalizes the flow differently depending on the volume of your space. And so the fresh air supplied, what this shows is that the fresh air supplied winds up be, meaning outside air or corridor air is better for both the supply and the balanced compared to the exhaust air, exhaust air buildings. Um, and let's see, what do I wanna say? This last comment here. And this is primarily because the corridor was positively pressurized. So we're not, uh, so what happens is the balance and supply systems have higher air change rates and the fresh air, um, then, then the fresh air rates 
from the exhaust only buildings. All right, so let's look at individual units. So we're back again to corner versus non corner. So the C prime is the uh, middle unit, and the C's, so rather than the C's and the C primes, the dark are the corner units, and the hashed ones are the uh, non corner units or the middle units. And basically what you see is that the fraction of outside air for an exhaust system is quite high for a corner unit um, and lower. This is the thing we talked about earlier. We're seeing the same thing here, except in this case, we're looking at the, let's say, I'm trying to think what, why we pull this different separately. Um, and then the fraction of neighbor's air it's the same type thing, but what you're seeing is that in the supply only quarter unit, you have more neighbor's air. In the exhaust, you have less neighbor's air, and in the balanced, you have somewhere in between those two. And that as you go, oh, I know, I know what's different here. We're looking at, we're not looking at leakage levels here. These are all done, I believe, at 0.15, right? At, at the leakage level that we, we thought we wanted to go to. Um, the other item is that as you go, as you're in the, when you're in the middle of the building, the fraction of your air that you're getting from your neighbor is higher when you're in exhaust and lowest when you're in, let's make sure I say this correctly, imbalanced. So the supply imbalance system for very little infiltration, which suggests, and this is important, right? I wanted to point this out, that balanced systems with heat recovery could save significant heating and cooling energy. So you're not getting very much infiltration in a balanced unit, since you're not getting very much infiltration, that means that you are able to do recovery as long as you actually put in a balanced system that's balanced, right? Unlike what we found in the field. And this is the same thing I said earlier. Okay, Debbie, you're back on. Um, yes, I am. I just that really there's not a, a significant a huge difference between the exhaust and supply and the balance when we're looking at the no2 um but we do see that looking at the unit the no2 concentration in um your own unit there's slightly higher levels um with the exhaust system um than the balance system and that's uh due to a higher overall ventilation rate with the supply or the balance, which then um, brings down the NO2 in your own apartment. And um, when you're looking across to what's coming in from the other units, the exhaust distribution, um, if you are not using your kitchen fan is, which just based on the um, natural pressure differences is slightly higher. Um, indicating that that's bringing more over than with the balanced, which is the lowest. So you can see that red one when you're not turning your fan on so that you're not um, driving the uh, pressure differences with the fan, you do see a slightly lower concentration. And that's all I've got there. Oh, sorry. And then I, I was reading the comment, which I don't quite understand. So we're going to have to come back to that one later at the end of the presentation. And this is looking at the similar uh, plots for benzene and formaldehyde with the formaldehyde one on the left. You do see that you have formaldehyde was really driving formaldehyde concentrations is the ventilation rate. And so since the supply and the balance do have higher ventilation rates, um, you do see the lower concentration distributions than for the exhaust system. And 
when you are looking at the concentration being brought over from the unit, you see that with the exhaust system, you have um, slightly higher. And with both the supply and the balance, you have less transfer between the units. Next slide. And then I think we're ready for the next slide, Mark. Okay, and we're gonna turn it back to Mark for the Energy Plus um, modeling. Okay, so everybody is used to these figures. You see them all the time, the infamous brown and yellow of the prototype buildings. So the specification of the building was, as I said, the multifamily IAQ case report building. Um, what we did is we took the outputs and have them because we were going from 10 to five stories. Um, let's see, yeah, here's a DOAS central supply air with preheating and cooling coils was deleted from the building. And the entire space conditioning load was met by in-unit package heat pump. So the building we modeled was an electric only building. So the, the combination with content, this is, this is where we had to do some sort of fancy dancing if you'd like. So I mentioned this earlier, the outdoor airflow, sort of the infiltration plus the supply ventilation was taken from ComTAM and it was subtracted from the NG plus base case value. And the change in outdoor airflow combined with the TMY weather data was used to calculate cha changes in, in heating loads, which is the product of the change in airflow and the enthalpy differential between the indoors and outdoor. And that was done for each time step in the year. So the load changes were combined with the, oh, that's just something else we did take. I didn't mention that earlier from Energy Plus is we use the variations in HVAC efficiencies that are modeled inside Energy Plus within each time step to calculate the implications for different cases. So in other words, in any given hour, we would not only look at the change of load, but also look at the efficiency that Energy Plus came up with for that hour. So here's the original results. So this is the annual energy use. Remember, this is an electric only building. So this is all energy. So there's the fan energy use is right down here. Heating is the black and cooling is the gray. And as I mentioned um, earlier, what you see is that there's actually more cooling energy in San Francisco than there is heating energy. Now you expect that in other places, but um, not in San Francisco. So the impact of not allowing any window openings, which is basically saying that the building is gonna get overheated um, and you're gonna only run your air conditioner at all the time, even if the outdoor air is wonderful. So if you reduce the unit leakage in that case, it actually increases cooling loads because you lose the free cooling from excess outdoor airflow in leaky units. So in other words, what we're saying is that if you don't allow window openings and you say, okay, we're just gonna have the building run on the thermostat, no one's ever gonna open their windows, then San Francisco is gonna wind up being a cooling dominated climate. And you're gonna wind up, if you tighten the building, you're gonna make it worse because you're getting free cooling from leakage, which goes away when you tighten, when you tighten the building. So what we did is develop a post-processing methodology to eliminate cooling loads in periods when the outdoor conditions support opening windows, or for that matter, running an economizer, but we didn't model an economizer uh, in order to maintain comfort. So we identified all hours during which Energy Plus showed a cooling load 
and the outdoor enthalpy was lower than the indoor enthalpy. So we only looked at those hours and we eliminated the cooling load for that, that hour and assumed that window opening or economizer operation produced an outdoor airflow rate of 200 CFM for that hour. So we didn't say, okay, the load just goes away. We just said that we're gonna assume that you're gonna get that much airflow through the space during that hour and then calculate what that means in terms of the, of the loads. And then this is the sort of dicey assumption in my mind is once you do that, you then have to figure out when you are cooling in the other hours with the cooling load that I was with the cooling load and the outdoor conditions is not equal, excuse me, the outdoor conditions are not cooler than indoors. So in other words, I was in the really is cooling. So in that case, you're saying that, okay, when I tighten the building, what's gonna happen is we're gonna have less outflow, less flow of outdoor air into the building. And in those hours, the outdoor air is higher enthalpy than the indoor air. So without, we were not able to figure out how to model that without spending lots and lots of time futzing around inside Energy Plus. So we wind up assuming that the percentage reduction in cooling load in those other hours was equal to the percentage savings for hours with heating. I, I do understand it's not, not the best way to do it, but we, without going crazy, we couldn't have come up with a better way. And the cooling savings were not all that dramatic. Um, anyway, in those, well, except in some climates they are. But in the climates where the cooling savings are dramatic are climates where there wasn't all that much of window opening anyway. So all this really mattered in was in San Francisco. So now if you do the same thing, the same plot that we showed earlier, what you see is that San Francisco now has more heating than cooling, which made me feel better. And the other climates didn't change quite so dramatically. So now let's come to the results. So we did it for both balanced buildings, buildings balanced with a heat exchanger, and buildings exhaust only and building supply only. For the balanced buildings, we looked at three different, well, there's more than this, but this is what I'm presenting. Three different leakage levels, and you have the annual energy use. And what you see, this is for Sacramento, as you go from 0.15 up to 0.45, you see the energy use increase. If you were balanced and you stayed at 0.15, you get an even more dramatic savings by putting a heat exchanger on the balance system. But the range of savings associated with tightening was three to six percent. So not necessarily sort of game changing, but since it seems that you can do this tightening fairly, like no one had any, apparently had any trouble getting the tightening done to get a three to 6% energy savings and GHG savings, while at the same time improving IAQ suggests that compartmentalization is not a bad idea. But if you're just after energy, or if you're also, if you're really after energy, do the heat exchanges. We did not analyze that, sort of the cost effectiveness of that, nor did we do the fan power. So this was kind of beyond the scope of the study, but I think it was worth noting anyway. And these savings are associated with eliminating a fan, right? If you kept it tight and you eliminate one fan, meaning you go from a balanced system with two fans to an unbalanced system, either supply or exhaust, you wind up saving a non-trivial amount of energy, about half as much as with putting in a heat exchanger, but again, this number is gonna be dumbed down somewhat. So, we're back to conclusions, which I sort of gave you them earlier on, but let's do it again. So, the measured unit leakage levels were about 50% lower than code, 
suggesting that a tighter standard is achievable. The unit leakage and then ventilation flow rates did not vary dramatically, but 10 or 15% standard deviation. Do you want to do this, Debbie? No, why don't you go ahead and read it this time? Okay. <laughs> so compartmentalization to stricter leakage targets results in lower gaseous pollutant transfer. Um, as we said, we didn't see any non-gaseous pollutant transfer. So tighter or not tighter, we could, we could model it, but if there's no transfer, there's no transfer. Um, uh, we didn't like we didn't notice, we didn't measure, we're not able to measure any transfer. And for units with gas stoves, the NO2 expo exposure was higher than the outdoor regulatory level if the kitchen exhaust fan was not used, but that was not the goal of the study, but that's what we found. And modeling the highest leakage level, units living next to a smoker wind up with benzene exposure and obviously smelling of smoke, well, benzene exposure above the cancer risk level in the leakier building, whereas not in the tighter buildings, and they don't smell the smoke, same kind of thing, or, or much lower exposure to smoke smells in those same buildings. So we just talked about this. The HVAC and GHG savings were modest, you know, 4 to 6% when going from 0.45 down to 0.15. And additional savings was available either by going from balanced to single, vandal, single fan ventilation or by adding a heat exchanger to your balanced system. So those seem to show much larger energy impacts, um, but those are not going to show you any indoor air quality impacts. Um, I mentioned this, Energy Plus results had to be modified to account for window openings. Mostly where it made a difference was San Francisco. And then the current assumptions that Energy Plus uh, dramatically overestimate, overestimates the infiltration loads compared to what we found in uh, Contam. So in terms of potential code implications, sort of the bottom line, uh, tidal leakage targets, in the, in the code are clearly achievable. There are modest energy and greenhouse gas savings and measurable IAQ pro improvements associated with going to tidal leakage targets. And more significant energy savings and greenhouse gas savings can be achieved either by eliminating two fans or adding a heat exchanger, but the heat exchanger results, I didn't point that out in detail, were clearly climate dependent. And as I mentioned, I mentioned this a couple of times, we didn't calculate the extra fan power associated dealing with the, the uh, pressure drops associated with those heat air to air heat exchangers. And now we are in theory done. So, are there any questions that didn't go in the chat that people would like to ask now? Yeah, thank you very much to uh, Mark and Debbie for the great presentation. A lot of information and a lot of details. And if you want to dig in more details, please check out uh, the final reports posted on our website. There are much more uh, detailed results and discussion in that report. So yeah, uh, again, uh, we already have uh, quite a few questions answered uh, in the chat. If you're interested, please take a look at the chat. And if you have additional questions, please unmute yourself and state your name and ask a question. Okay, uh, maybe before, uh, before um, the audience uh, Ask question. I have a question. Like, so you mentioned the limitation that not including windows in the energy class, and I think you already communicate this with uh, the case team. Do they provide any feedbacks in terms of like energy plus uh, updates or for the future? Thanks. 
Mark, you're you're not. We can't hear you. Yeah. That's kind of weird because like, I'm I'm not muted. Okay, you're back. <laughs> That's you're very back. strange. Okay. Yeah. Um. Well, all I did is I put the meeting chat above the mute button. I don't know why that would make me not be able to hear me. But at any rate, um, what I was saying is that there are two things we talked with the case team about. One was the excess infiltration in the modeling. And the other is the use of window openings. Um, I believe the excess, I don't know what they decided to do with that. Um, is is Marion at any by any chance on the call? She, hey guys, I think, can you hear me? This is Marion. Yes, we can hear you. Yep. Yeah, great presentation. Um, I will say so. First off, uh, I'm um, working with a team to update or to propose updates to the next version of Child 24 Part Six um, that leverages research. So big thanks to um, Mark and Debbie for providing some great data for that. In terms of the modeling updates, I have talked a bit with Bruce Wilcox's team about this, but I think that's um, a conversation that needs to continue. And I, I see some other energy, I see some energy commission staff on the call. I'm sure they'll be wanting to get involved in that conversation. But I think that in general, yes, the plan is for the next version of the software to reduce the assumption for infiltration, in part to account for the fact that we are proposing to make the code no longer balanced ventilation or compartmentalization, but you have to do balance or supply ventilation and compartmentalization. So since all buildings would have compartmentalization, then the infiltration should come down. Um, and I know that um, I did recommend that they use your um, results here to inform their modeling assumptions. And then in terms of the window assumptions, I don't know, that's a trickier one. Um, I don't know if there anyone on the Energy Commission wants to speak to that, uh, but I don't think at the moment I'm aware of any plans to adjust it for that, but I think it's a, it's a good idea. Thank you. And so, Marion, do you know what number they're thinking of for the tightness level of compartmentalization? I don't think they know. What I was suggesting was that they take a look at um, results gathered from various studies, including there's a code readiness study happening. Jeff, Jeff Stollers on the on the call. He's been doing some work there, um, some work that was done in other states. And I, my suggestion was to basically look at like, well, what are the what is the building leakage? for buildings that are between about 0.2 and 0.3 CFM 50 per square foot in terms of compartmentalization. And then if we can look at the um, the building infiltration for um, for buildings that have units compartmentalized around that level, that might be the, um, the estimated infiltration value that we, they should be looking at. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? Woody Delp, I've got a question for you, Mark. I'm dealing with an older class of a multifamily building. Actually, it's an SRO in San Francisco or a group of SROs in San Francisco. Would you care to take a guess at what kind of leakage values we may see in a hundred year old, you know, presumably low income building even at the time? And would you, and do you think, do you think Sorry, you're Aeroseal would would help deal with compartmentalization on a building of that vintage. Okay, so was the guess to see how good of a guesser I am? Like, do you know the answer? No, I just I've been looking at some part. Ironically, particle data coming in, and the numbers are astronomically high, presumably because there's some smoking in the units. And I think we may be seeing some transfer of the cigarette smoke from unit to unit, but I can't be for sure. So I've just looked at some PM data and have seen alarming, shocking numbers. And there are some efforts to try to do some retrofits in more of these buildings. Okay, so um, I haven't thought this through, but I'll give my off the cuff response. Um, in terms of the overall leakage level, if they're old buildings, I would guess a bunch of the leakage is to exterior in the sort of double hung windows, yep, right? Yep. There's, there's gonna be a bunch of leakage there. Um, long time ago, like really a long time ago, we did testing in Chicago. And what we found is that the way the buildings were constructed there in the old buildings, there were essentially vertical paths, like all the way up the building. So when you tried to do a guarded blower door test on a unit, 
you were seeing things like three units away, two floors away, because you were basically pressurizing an airflow path, which like the building is like boxes floating in with a bunch of airflow paths, like boxes inside a giant box. With And I don't know if the San Francisco buildings will be like that. So that said, I think whether it's that and, wh and whether you're not interested, if, if you're okay with just sealing the interior leaks, I would say manual sealing of plumbing penetrations could go a long way. And aerosol sealing of the units to unit to unit, I think is doable. Um, the question is gonna be if they're occupied units, that's that's gonna be uh, someone who wants to be admitted into the meeting. They, I, I just said, yes, um, they're, they're a little late. Um, I think that if they're occupied units, it will be a challenge to do aerosol sealing. But if they are that like balloon construction, like we saw in Chicago, we actually could consider, we've been doing this now, uh, Curtis knows about this, but injecting in an attic and then depressurizing the unit, the, the, in a single family house, injecting in the attic and depressurizing the house and then having the sealant seal while trying to come into the unit. And that we were quite successful at that. In the multifamily construction, it may be worth thinking about trying to do that where you go into an attic and it goes down some of those vertical pathways between the units. Does, it, does that make any sense what I'm saying? Yep, it makes a lot of sense. Yep. I may, I may talk to you later about this, but uh, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, any questions any other questions okay well i see now so well uh thanks again for uh mark and debbie for this wonderful presentation and thank you everyone for spending time with us and if you have any follow-up questions to me or to uh mark or debbie please feel free to contact me and or then so uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.